So I'm talking about a lot of host-based stuff because there's you know growing problems just kind of scooping useful data out of um, network streams. You know, for a variety of reasons, you've got, you know, I won't do that again. Um, you know, the kind of the default encryption for the new HTTP. You have issues with, you know, layers of security that have nothing to do with the network. Um, so, like, or maybe they, you know, transport to them, but the real issues sit on the machine, you know. And so, got to do stuff about that, right? Especially if you know you're in the environment that I'm in, which I'll get to later. So I've spun up a couple of different projects to address what I see are some fundamental issues. Um, one of them is instrumented SSHD. Um, I'll go into that kind of briefly because I, you know, have talked about it at some length before, and um, probably will continue to. Um, more interesting thing I've got going on is Audit D. Um, I've figured out a way to make Audit D work at, at scale. And then um, kind of a, d a new thing, which is not well prepared, so I apologize ahead of time, is kind of like an object abstraction where I uh, create kind of an additional layer on top of uh, the event stream and kind of operate at that level. And hopefully, with some luck, I will both get to those slides and they will make sense. So. And by the way, if like there's total confusion, just raise your hand or throw something, and I will pay attention. Um, so instrumented SSHD, the first of three. So background on it. Way back in 2007, we were kind of grappling with some problems at NERSC. Um, we had six major platforms. These are big supercomputers. You know, very expensive, very complicated. Um, they're really tricky because um, performance is performance wins. You can't mess with the user experience. And um, we were transitioning to 100 gig, which was a whole, you know, that's a whole other set of presentations. Um, we have over, at the time, we had like well, greater than 4,000 users worldwide. Everybody has SSH access to these giant platforms, which are basically big Unix boxes um, with added complexity, um, shell accounts, Passwords without two-factor authentication is the de facto go. And um, you got to remember that people log in and run arbitrary stuff um, as themselves, thankfully. But um, nonetheless, it's kind of a complicated um, universe. We have no clue what people are really doing. You can run top or look at PS or even you know process accounting, but that doesn't tell you anything um, as far as live attack stuff. So. A quick uh, design moving forward. Um, so this is what we ended up uh, doing. So we, we tried to normalize all the data. You know, key value pairs are happy things because there's just a lot of arbitrary stuff and that's almost worse than not having anything at all. Um, we URI encode everything because we assume, um, as Vern made an assumption, that the an analysis platform will be attacked. We, you know, we're not gonna just throw arbitrary um, binary goo at the analyst and hope that it doesn't make their terminal do bad things. Um, we disconnect the data flow from the instrumented SSH. You know, it's totally uh, disconnected. So when my lousy code crashes on the back end, it doesn't interfere at all with the experience of the users, because I'd rather lose data than mess that up. Um, metadata, totally valuable. You know, we're initially interested in keystrokes, but there's a lot of other stuff that um, SSH has going on that's really interesting. And then, obviously, we want to access all of the data um, transiting the SSH channels on the uh, in the session. Uh, and I just put this slide up because this is like many months of work, because like many open source projects, OpenSSH actually has both awesome documentation on the developer side and no documentation as far as like the architecture. And so we had to do kind of a code walk through, you know, what happens when you log in and what are the options. 
because this was the map that we used to define what was interesting within SSH. Um, so that's, you know, it's not that exciting, but yay. So um, this, is what this is how it works. So we have, you know, the big S, instrumented SSH instance running on a host. Um, there's an S tunnel connected to a local port, which drops the data back to the, the backend bro analysis. So what happens? Somebody logs in. And SSHD starts, you know, recording data, dumping it into the S tunnel, um, into a log. So there, there are several kind of stop points. Um, and this log is kind of the point of truth as far as we're concerned, because this is pure raw data out of the instrumented SSH and before Bro even looks at it. So we kind of disconnect it. So in theory, you don't even need Bro to gain some kind of utility out of the instrumented SSH. But we use the um, wonderful input framework to digest this um, log and, and turn it into events. And so uh, like a one line of the log file, which is tremendously huge, it looks something like this. You know, you've got timestamps and version strings and just kind of what the, what the user typed, which isn't very exciting. And then a couple of other bits and pieces. Um, it gets processed by an event on the back end, which looks like that, because you know, having a representation for an actual binary event is kind of silly. Um, and then Bro takes the it takes the information, logs it. You know, this this single line happened, and then applies local security policy to it, which is kind of a model that. Bro uses as kind of a de facto thing, and it works really well, and it's something I've used again and again, and it just never doesn't work. So it's extremely helpful. You get kind of the agnostic logs, which, and then you've got local policy applied against the uh, data stream, which is happy. Um, there's like a collection of event groups that uh, is, done, you've got core, which is essentially just really non-even user stuff. It's like, you know, an SSHD starts, it stops. There's a heartbeat to let you know when someone um, hacks into the machine and replaces SSHD, because um, the heartbeat stops, which is kind of handy. And then just some basic telemetry as far as um, event rates and whatnot. Um, the metadata that I mentioned before is actually really cool, because, you know, It'll tell you what it's port forwarding. You know, this is where I'm port forwarding. X11 stuff, channel creation, sockets, tunneling. Um, and what you can do is write local security policy. And you can say, well, I don't want my users to tunnel stuff or to run a SOC server on my supercomputer. Um, and so it'll, you know, in a normal instance, you may not care, but if you do care, you get a notice about this, or a page, or an email, or whatever, and that's, that's really handy. And it, um, I like that. Authentication information, which is darn handy as well. Um, you get information not only about what worked, but you get, um, you can, if you are suitably motivated, you can record passwords. Um, if you are not suitably motivated, you can record um, kind of hashes of passwords, but not, you know, they're, they're built in such a way that if someone's doing a dictionary attack, you can identify that, but you can't kind of work backwards to the uh, actual password. Um, other stuff, key, key fingerprints, users, key exchange, all that information which is handy as well, because you can see if users are sharing passwords or keys or whatnot. Uh, user IO, obviously, what the users are typing, what the users are executing, what the users are executing without terminals, um, all of that stuff. This is you know, the original motivation to get the, uh, the project going. And then SFTP, you get just kind of basic utility out of that too. You can see what your users are moving back and forth. So um, an example, I have 45 minutes, right? OK, good. Um, I need to hurry up. Just a classic remote exec sh 
exact shell, so you SSH it to something, you exec sh-i. This was an extremely common thing a few years back for people you didn't want on your system. They run ID, they exit. You know, you're just doing a basic kind of, kind of like a hacker unit test. Um, this is what you see on the server side, and you don't have to read it. It's just kind of like the idea is that we capture a vast quantity of information, um, most of its metadata, because the user didn't really do much. Um, but they did do one thing, which is kind of interesting. They remotely exact an sh-i, which is happens to um, make my pager go off, because it's rare enough in the uh, false positive notion that it's really worth it. Uh, another example, this is a uh, kind of a cleaned up example of what someone actually did on one of our systems and what we saw. Um, I kind of scooped out a lot of the extraneous information from the logs. Um, kind of on the left side, you see the event type, and on the right side, you see the data. And, you know, they just, they once again exact sh-i. They unset the hist file still, as Vern you know, started looking for yonks ago, um, people still do that. And very few of them are um, users that you expect. They, you know, this is just kind of a classic. They download a kit. And so what we're looking for is we've got, you know, kind of behavior rules and we've got data value rules. So um, behavior rules are just things that the users are doing that are exceptionally weird for a valid user to do, like, you know, unsetting a hist file, for example. Some of them do, um, but not that many. And then data value rules, just things, you know, we can, I'm tremendously grateful for the hacker community kind of standardizing on interfaces <laughs> and um, saying, you know, common ling words and stuff, because it's darn handy. Because, you know, your average user will not type known with an O or targets or whatever. But um, people running standard kits will. Um, the other handy thing you get is uh, kind of soft data. You get to kind of understand a lot of information about people poking around in your computers. And this is a, an exceptionally rich example of that in that two attackers were sharing terminals, so they were um, and so they were kind of typing back and forth to each other. And they figured out that they were sitting, you know, they did, you know, they just checked like how big the ARP cache was. And it's like almost 10,000 entries. And they like kind of stopped and scratched their heads and, you know, go, go smoke a cigarette and figure it out. And um, there's a lot more information in the actual data. And these were like, these were not dumb people. They were doing, they were making good decisions and, kind of iteratively closing in on how they were going to take over the box, which they didn't. But, um, you know, it's really cool because you get, it kind of, it both humanizes the people attacking as well as really understanding that they may actually not be total noobs. And, um, you know, they were not dumb kids. They knew a lot about um, Unix internals. And so where we sit now is um, it's been in production for several years, several being, you know, about five. We run it on four to 425 systems. You know, we get 30 to 50 million log, logs, lines a day. Um, we have this vast quantity of um, kind of back data. I mean, it's just text files, so it compresses nicely and it doesn't take up any real space as compared to like PCAPs. And, um, we have done a lot of architectural changes and um, will again, thanks to the broker framework, um, and rewrite all my code now. Um, and so there's kind of a clustering version of it now so that you aren't limited by the ability for a single um, worker instance to digest logs. And that is ISSH. That took five minutes longer than I hoped. Oh well, um, I will probably speed up at some point, so I apologize. So Audit D, um, yay. So I was dissatisfied with um, the instrumented SSH. I mean, it's super cool and it's like, you give such vast insight, but you aren't really knowing, you're, you're seeing what the users are typing, but you're not really, don't really know what's going on in the box itself. 
And so this is a blurb from Red Hat about what, you know, what is Audit D? And really, it's not that interesting. But the point is, is that you can get information out of the system that includes, you know, an alarming amount of detail. You can get system call information and your file system accesses and execution and device information. And so you have to kind of figure out what it is that you actually need so that you don't get totally creamed on um, performance because performance is the one place that we can't mess with. Um, that and user experience and interfering in the science and a bunch of other things. But um, so, but why Audit D? You know, what is this Audit D thing? Um, well, it's ubiquitous. It's, it's everywhere. It's kind of built into the kernel. It has been for a really long time. It's reasonably stable. It's um, in as much as anything is, it is well understood and documented, which means it's not well documented and it's not well understood, but it's <laughs> better documented and better understood than most of the options out there. And it is extraordinarily powerful when used correctly. Um, why not? Why would I not use Audit D? Um, when I started discussing this with the administrative staff, um, they got the fear, right? They're like, you know, they're not super familiar with it, but they know that it will cause their problem, you know, their systems to like burst into flame and stop working. Um, why not? Well, you have to use it correctly. So again, it's powerful when used correctly, but that is almost an argument against using it. Um, the logging, this is, you know, one of the, and ultimately the biggest pushback was like, the logging in it is horrible. And it's less horrible than most things, but it's still absolutely hostile to machine analysis. And if you're gonna be, plug this into like a thousand machines, you can't like expect to troll the logs, right? Um, and then scale issues, which is a byproduct of the aggressively hostile logging. Um, you know, it's really, it was built in theory without being stuck on one machine, but really that was the mindset of the developers, which is totally okay, because we'll fix that. Um, so the really big picture, it's like, well, what am I hoping to do here? Um, you wanna take, so you have to kind of like look and see what system calls are really actually interesting from a security perspective. You wanna scoop them up, record the relevant parts, got to get the data off the system because, you know, if you record someone taking root, you know, the first thing they do is delete the log. So you can't assume that anything after that zero point is even meaningful. And then, you, you know, again, you don't want to create another data silo because, as we all know, the, you know, we have all these data silos and it's individually they're kind of cool, but you want to be able to integrate this information across your various bits and pieces. So... <laughs> This slide should look vaguely familiar um, because I'm not afraid to reuse code or slides. So um, kind of like on this side, you've got the kernel or the, you know, the kind of the core uh, system. And really the only thing that you need to do to affect change on the system is to, there's like a log configuration file and an auto deconfig file. And you drop those in and you're good to go. Um, then you just have like all of these aggressively hostile um, logs. So I spent a bunch of time working on a log normalizer kind of schema and, and, and it's just a blob of Python and it, you know, leaks memory. So I'm working on that now. But, uh, you know, and again, you, you just create these normalized logs. You just tunnel them back to the analyzer and it's just like it was before. So this normalization that I've inferred so you've got these raw logs, they have dozens of different fields and they're inconsistent and um, they kind of back reference each other. So each line is not independent of one another. And so what I did is I stared at the logs for yonks and it was, you know, not a fun six months, but you know, I have like my day job too. So it probably someone dedicated probably could have done it in like two days, but you know. Um, and so I ended up breaking things up into uh, two basic notions of log lines. So you have these core things, which are, you know, kind of fundamental entities that 
kind of stand by themselves. And you have these append things, which affect change. You know, they add information, but they, by themselves, they don't really define a significant thing. So each of these becomes like an object type. And, um, and that way, I only have to deal with six things instead of, you know, zillions of things. And each of these has well-defined fields, well-defined types. So suddenly, you have this machine-friendly format of data. And so this was kind of cool. Um, so this is what the raw logs look like. So this is just, you know, just executing something. You have this vast, you know, you just look at it and you're like, ugh, right? Because who knows what all that is? And um, so the main red box is like the big action. This is like someone did something and you get these three lines and the green one's core, the blue ones are the append lines. So the core is like that defines the thing and then the append lines are like, this is more information about the thing, right? Um, and it's not worth trying to parse. So what comes out, I decided not to um, try to impose any state building on the local host because you know, you're already worried about causing problems. And really, once you try to build state into something, you start losing a lot of information. And um, I don't want to do that. You know, that all happens back on the analysis side. What you do do, though, is you have to kind of like normalize against the local machine in case um, your syscall number is, you know, you want to turn it into a name. So open is open, no matter what. But, you know, if it happens to be a different syscall number because it's got a different um, machine type or whatever. You know, Linux has a lot of foibles. And you want to normalize against the foibles as well as you have, like, uh, user identity. So UID, like, 42 on one box might not be UID 42 on the other. And so rather than keeping 42 around, um, you just keep the converted user ID. Um, an example of kind of log normalizing is, like, the system call here. You know, it's a system call. It's a system call exec. So we've kind of defined it down uh, less. And this is just an example of the taxonomy that I created. It's not super interesting, so I'm going to not like dwell on it because I'm already starting to get short on time. Um, and this is just more examples of the normalizing that goes on. So you've got, you know, 59 is exec, which is a very common one. But um, you want to keep exec around and not 59 because who knows what will come down the pipe. And then the notion of identity is actually held in um, eight in eight tuple. You know, so you've got, you know, UID, GID, effective UID, blah, blah, blah. So um, there's a whole bunch of them. And so you have to watch all of them at the same time, which is kind of cool. Um, but we'll get to the back end, because that's where Bro lives. And that's what we're here to talk about. Um, so in the Bro back end, you, that's where all the state is tracked. And again, we're doing our extremely friendly paradigm of um, logging and then applying security policy to it. And so you have to kind of like figure out, once you get all this data, you're like, what do I do with it, right? Because um, it's almost like an embarrassment of riches from a security perspective. And so you know, you have to figure out how to fit all the state together, and then you have to figure out how to apply your, your policy to it. So going back to our fun um, six objects, you know, the core and the appends, um, this is another head scratcher. So this is like months pass. And then um, I decided that to break things up into a notion of an identity, which lasts at least as long as a login session, and then a series of actions. So because you know you log in, and you're like somebody, and then you do something, and then you're still somebody, and you do another thing. And so the action is like the transient thing, and the identity lasts as long as you're more, you know, metaphorically at least logged into the box. Um, so. I create you know, like an identity object, and I create an action object. And um, identity sticks around, and action doesn't. You, you may want to hold on to it anyways. So here's an example. You know, something happens, right, on your box. And so you look it up. You, you know, you take the, the syscall object, and you're like, have I, seen this? have I seen this person before? Have I seen this identity before? And if you have, you fill in, you know, you pull the data structure out of the table, 
And if you haven't, you know, you fill it in, right? You start anew. And then you've got, this is, this is a really ugly slide, and I apologize. I was looking at it this morning and going, oh my god, what a horror show. Um, but like you take, you know, all of your pen stuff, you kind of fill in the action, right? Because you have all these lines and you need to kind of fill in your object. Well, and, and then for whatever reason, I decided to put the identity structure here um, to kind of muddle the fact that what's going on. Um, but what I do have is the, um, this is where we kind of keep track of the identity here. And those are the different core things that Unix has to offer you as far as who you are. You're a bunch of people. We all have multiple personalities. And then um, below, I kind of keep track of the previous one because with each, um, with each core object, you need to kind of like look back and say, who was I before? To make sure that you, are, you haven't changed. And so essentially, you have this thing where you have an identity, and it gets tacked onto each of the actions. Um, this was a much more complex slide, which is why it looks kind of anemic. But um, that was really the idea that I wanted to get across. And so that's more or less what the state looks like inside. So now we get to the policy. We're like, OK, we have this embarrassment of riches. And what do we do with it, right? Um, the most obvious thing to look for is identity transitions. Because you, know, you want your users to be your users more or less always, right? You know, but there's always like little things you can do. Um, you're totally interested, I at least am, in being able to map um, network activity to a specific user. So if you see like this weird connection coming from one of your super user interactive nodes with like 50 people on it, you can figure out who did what. Um, execution, obviously, thing, people execute things. You want to know all about that, because you don't want them to execute the wrong things or you know, have some weird SUID binary just show up and have someone execute it, that's, that's good to know. Um, absolute paths are handy as well. So if ls starts coming out of temp, um, that's bad, right? And, uh, and then like file system activity, this is, I'm still kind of playing with this. You know, you, you, can, you can kind of decide where you don't want your users to be, because every time you exec something in the system call, it hands off the current working directory. So if, you know, if your user's hanging out in proc, that might be kind of interesting. Um, sometimes they do, because users are interesting people. But um, nonetheless, and then you can like, track file system errors. You know, if someone tries to create 500 files, or 500 you know, file creation system calls, and they all fail, well, you know, it may not be hostile, but it might be worth um, investigating, if nothing else, so that you can contact the user and be like, do you need help? Because really, this is annoying. So um, the thing I spent most of my time on is the identity transitions, because it's, you know, it's, the most, it's the most obvious. It's like the clear win. It's the easy case to argue for. You know, when your user becomes root, you want to know, right? Um, it's kind of like one of the things that I thought about, and I thought I had this in a previous slide, is, you know, you can, with this much information, you can make your application like, like a Hollywood movie. You know, when your hacker is like doing something and then the alarms go off, right? But without the alarms, it could be like a notice instead. But, um, and one of those things that, you know, happens in real life and, or, you know, happens in movies and not in real life is, is identity transact transition uh, finding, you know? And so I'm like, I want to do that. That seems really cool, so I did. Um, but I, you know, I, I carefully explored at least 50 failed, you know, cul-de-sacs, and I, I just wandered around and did a lot of really interesting things. But um, ultimately, I had the epiphany that, you know, there's a lot of executables on um, on a typical Unix box, which are SUID root. Um, but thankfully, they've at least been plowed over by hackers enough times that the point in time, you know, within the executable where 
the user is in fact root is very tiny. You know, for ping, it's just like one system call, right? When you open the raw socket. Um, and so when a user turns into root for a tiny amount of time, then it's no big deal, right? It's like one system call worth of time. But if they happen to become root for a long period of time, that's, that's not so good, you know? It's, it's worthy of investigation. Um, there are some applications like SSHD that by their very nature um, have these kind of long-term transitions between identities. But again, you have executables that you have absolute paths. You can, you know, you can whitelist this stuff. And it's certainly worth the risk of a, of a poorly built whitelist. And so this is kind of like what it looks like, right? So the user executes ping and you know, system calls happen, plunk, plunk, plunk. And then they open the raw socket. And for a tiny amount of time, for one system call, the user is root. And so what I do is um, I don't care what happens inside of the windows. So, you know, I will totally miss this, which is good because I don't care. It's just one system call. But if Johnny Hacker comes along and um, executes a local uh, privilege escalation uh, exploit and becomes root for a long time, and long time might just be seconds, um, I get a notice. And it tells me, you know, I, what I get is not only do I get a notice, um, this is the host. So it's like this host, it, um, this is the identity that changed. So it might be, you know, UID, GID, effective, all of that, you know, that whole eight tuple that I was talking about, any of those. Um, this is the transition, me, transition to root. And this is what got executed. And, you know, so you can take a quick look at the notice and be like, you know, that is totally not okay. Um, you know, var temp x, not good, right? Um, and so that's, that's kind of handy. Um, the next piece I'm kind of interested in is um, the network data, the network side of things, right? So we can begin to associate user identities with network traffic. And um, again, this is one that I carefully explored any number of um, poorly architected ways of going about solving the problem until I kind of gave up. And um, it was just like, eh, I'll just log it. And then, you know, because I was trying to do like clever correlation things in Bro, um, which is total madness because there's like these things called databases that, you know, you can do all this with. So I decided to use these databases instead of um, writing vast quantities of spaghetti Perl code. Um, so, Essentially, I just broke it up into two things. You have, um, you have listeners and you have connections. So for a connection, you know, it's just kind of a classic, uh, you know, you get a socket for tuple, um, you get the protocol, you get state, you get a session ID, node, host name, and all this stuff, right? Um, and one of the problems is, is that when you just use a, a typical uh, socket open, you just let the operating system handle the, you know, what the source IP and the source port are. So usually they're zero in the system call. And so that's like the one kind of curiosity that you can't really get around without working a lot harder than I was willing to um, do. And so you end up getting this, this log file and which you can then, damn it, I said I wouldn't do that. Um, which you can then correlate to your um, network uh, ingress, egress point, and um, identify users and, and network traffic, which is darn handy. The other thing is uh, listeners. You want to know when you're, uh, when new listeners open up, right? And so you get just you know the same basic information. Only this is all about you know a, a socket that's opening up and attaching using the listener system call. And you can you know you're you're act you're um, looking at all this stuff on the system call level. So it's kind of hard to get around, you know, because you have to, there are just a set of system calls that have to happen to open up a socket on a, in a Unix box. And um, those are the things we're instrumenting. And so it's really hard to get around this stuff just because you, you need to get there before you own the box. And um, 
we happen to be there. So, and then just some execution stuff. You know, things are going to start to get a little bit looser. This is a code I haven't spent as much time on, so I don't have um, as many snappy examples. Um, but you know, you're interested in absolute paths. You, you can check. You know, you can have blacklists of where you don't want executions to come from. You know, you, you log anything that has anything to do with SUID bits um, or SGID or any of the other um, things that affect change on the A tuple. Um, absolute paths again. You know. People executing things out of temp is probably not a good idea, you know, because the while we might do that as people who poke around on machines, um, our typical user base is wholly uninterested in poking around. They have work to do, and they just do it. And anything that distracts them from that is like it just pisses them off. So um, thankfully, the kind of curmudgeon nature of our users um, limits the odd behavior. Not that they're curmudgeons. They just have a lot of personality. Um, so and then file system, the same kind of basic setup of, uh, of things. So you know, you, you're interested in where your users are, because there's, like, there's just places they shouldn't be. And so you know, like, like the boot partition, you know, it's like, what are you doing there? Right? Um, it's worthy of an email. Um, you look for systematic file errors and creations and whatnot, you know, directory issues, anything that you know involves open and file systems. It's um, it's pretty handy, and as well, you can um, <clears throat> you can tag changes on particular files too. So pretty much anything in Etsy, right? It wouldn't be bad to know if it changes, um, because you might have missed some other thing. Um, and if Etsy hosts or password changes, then um, someone has done something. Um, and this information might be useful both in terms of uh, security perspective as well as just for the administrators. And like, you know, if somebody, you know, fat fingered something, you can figure it out. Not that they do, because they are professionals, um, as are we all. Uh, so the conclusion so the current state of the prototype is I've got it on one mid range system. And really, it's kind of an experiment at this point because. You know, it's, it's like from a security perspective, you, we're still figuring out what we have, right? You know, you have all of this, this data and kind of a dynamic tool set to work on it. So we're figuring out what it is that we want to do with it. And um, we are always open for ideas. Um, and then, you know, we're looking for immutable, you know, one of the design pieces of this was like, we don't want to look for the ankle biters. And one of the things that I've noticed over the years is a lot of tool building goes on to identify ankle biters, which are almost wholly uninteresting from a larger security perspective. You know, we've heard about like APT attackers, and um, they're interesting. They're hard to find. And if you build a bunch of tools to find ankle biters, you'll find ankle biters and feel really good about yourself. But um, you will completely miss the actual attackers. And so, um, you know, we, did, we wanted to look at what are immutable things within kind of the attack path that have to happen no matter what, whether you're an ankle biter or whether you're someone who's an, a skilled attacker. You know, you have, there's only a finite number of doors, there are a finite number of transitions and changes, and those are the things that we're looking for. Um, the idea, and I, strangely, I had, a lot of people were like, well, so we can get rid of instrumented SSH. And it's like, no, this is just, this is like a different perspective on the same thing. So, you know, we want to work together. And then, you know, like I mentioned before, this is like a totally, you know, we're using the bro scripting language on the analysis side, and we can do almost anything. And so it's kind of, it's a really kind of open-ended problem. And so as this progresses, um, we'll see where it goes. And by the way, all of this code and all of everything is all um, in a GitHub repo. It's totally public. It's you know you can download it right this second. Although I don't, I wouldn't, um, <laughs> because uh, Robin's uh, announcements have completely messed up my world. But um, that's okay. You know, I don't mind, right? Um, so one of the things. Moving on to user abstraction. Um, 
Let me just get rid of the picture. Uh, so we need, you know, I'm, I'm using users as an example of a more generalized um, idea of like having to, looking at a data stream with kind of like a short time window of context and state is kind of unsatisfying. And there's a lot of basic ideas that we really need to invest some historical perspective in. And users happen to be a really good example because, you know, especially the, the curmudgeon users that I've been talking about tend to do a lot of the same thing. So looking for variations on that is good and interesting, but you need a lot of data for that. And so, you know, we're thinking about this in terms of um, primitives, like what is, what is a basic unit of, of useful uh, security information? Um, I just realized that I have like four minutes, so we're gonna go really fast. Um, so the primitive just holds metadata about the users, where they came from, countries, you can tack execution information in there, you can just, they can hold almost anything, right? And so the user object it holds metadata, but you can do execution profiling, job submission, metadata, library classes, all sorts of stuff. And so we came up with something um, that was really awesome uh, until two days ago. But, um, <laughs> no, actually it's a horror show and I'm totally excited to replace the code. Um, so we end up with an, like an SQLite database in the back end and then an interface to it. And then, so this is, um, Bro is everything but the circle. Um, and the data sources are just the, you know, instrumented SSH and Oddity and la la la. Uh, the SQLite has like kind of an agnostic notion of uh, a user login, because I'm just using user logins because it's totally simple and straightforward. Um, the data structure on the bro end uh, has this handy thing where you take the raw data and you break it up into subnets and countries and raw data. And, um, and so that way, every time you query the database, if you have to change your notion of subnets, it um, does that on the fly. And I guess country codes could change as well. Um, so user logs in, they, have you seen the user before? Like are in the, if they're in the local cache, then you just use that, process it, move on. If not, you have to go to the SQLite interface, it scoops the data out of the database, um, and then hands it back, it gets processed. And then you can say, you might get a notice. You're like, this is a new country, right? That's kind of interesting. Um, I'm just moving really quick now. Um, additional types of kind of object abstractions, clusters, cluster hosts, ex whole external sites, because there's like general generalized behaviors that you can apply this whole idea to virtual organizations is one that I kind of like. Um, I had to make a pyramid. I made this last night because pyramids appear to be the new thing. So um, this is how you uh, kind of apply things. You have raw data, you normalize it. You know, again, it's the same thing. It's not that exciting. And um, that's it. This is for Adam because he asked, I used to have a, a slide that had bunnies and kitties and a chicken in it and so, um, Yes, I'm done. So, um, <laughs> so this isn't entirely for Adam because he asked for it late last night. And uh, I may have drank a little bit. <laughs> it doesn't show. <laughs> Anyways, um, questions, comments, arguments, thingies. Yes. Yes. I kept hoping that this was going to end with like when you, you like you using the audit D stuff for a real incident. No, not yet. Have you thought so about that? Fast. Oh, totally. Yes. Absolutely. And um, I await its uh, its arrival. Because, um, I mean, there's obviously obvious places to fit in. At the same time, you've got, like, the spark side of things. You know, I have, I have the whole big picture in my head. And um, so in the meantime, we'll use SQLite. And once uh, VAST shows up, we'll be able to kind of granularize things a lot better. 
Um, the whole broker framework, um, all of this, all of these things, and a bunch of other stuff um, have been designed to operate in kind of cluster mode. So you have, rather than worker nodes having traffic spread against them, you have worker nodes, each of which does a specific function. You know, if you're instrumented SSH analyzer, you have your audit de analyzer, syslog, you can have multiple ones, and they're just worker nodes, proxy, you've got a, a manager node. And so I've had to do a lot of really weird stuff with the communications to get the idea across to the larger bro instance that different code runs on each of the worker nodes. And so with this, we'll be able to, you know, with the broker framework, I'm gonna be able to scrape off all of the awful things that I had to do to get um, interbro communication to act more like routed communication um, and actually be able to use directed communication. So pretty much all of the interconnectivity as well as all of the um, user object interaction will get rewritten. And it will probably go from this giant, terrifying, unpleasant, embarrassing ball of code to just simplicity, hopefully. You started this off by saying that you're not a scale on um, you know, What's the size of the telemetry stream from, from the notes you've got in general? Um, not, it's not huge because we, I mean, and I realize that's a very unsatisfying answer. Um, because the data stream is really a function of how many users are doing what on the system. And so... Well, it looks like you've got this all system activity, which is usually a, a huge... Yes. Uh, well, what I'm collecting is failed file system activity. And that's orders of magnitude smaller, hopefully. Um, if that ends up being a problem, I'll just cut it out. Um, because, again... I thought you were getting all files. Oh God, no, that would be very bad. We have very large file systems and um, sometimes users run fine on them and that would be very bad. <laughs> you know, when you have like a nine petabyte file system, it, yeah, that would be very bad. Um, so yes, um, currently we only look at the um, error related opens, but, um, Again, if that becomes an issue, it just, it goes. Can you arrow back to the pyramid? I need to get a picture. Up here, the mighty pyramid. Because everyone's doing pyramids now, apparently. I have pictures of that. <laughs> <laughs> yes? Presumably something that the administrators is worried about is some performance running out of D. Can you, is there a noticeable performance impact? Uh, no, the first year, and I need to, um, figure out a way to normalize this stuff. But I didn't actually do any work on the live production systems, but I took a couple crappy old boxes, figuring that you know anything that, any performance impact on those would be you know vastly amplified as compared to like a really robust system. Um, and I saw on the average 0.1% um, change on I.O. related things, and as far as like, you know, compiling time and stuff, there's no real effect. Because I, you know, I very carefully selected the system calls to um, really only take the ones that are interesting from uh, networking and security side. So a lot of the kind of the meat and potato system calls I, are not um, touched. Because you can take all of the things, um, but that, then all of the smoke leaks out of the system, so we don't like that. Um, yeah. um, do you have any, uh, would you expand this to possibly look at the historical information a user gives you? So you've looked at like windows of root, and you've looked at specific calls that, that do unexpected things. Um, but for users that do do unexpected things, um, would you use Procure to possibly try to uh, keep state for over the last six months he's used X number of applications, certain ones he's used root at certain times, and, and try to create a stateful object for the user over the lifetime of their own network. That is that is the ideal. Um, that is really what I was hoping to do, because you know I mean a lot of this is driven by 
I want to do some, you know, like machine learning analysis. But as um, as Robin has pointed out, and um, the failure of machine analysis in the uh, or machine learning analysis in the um, security community, a lot of it is like you need to really hand out the right data. And so this is my, you know, I'm kind of circling back now that I know what the users are doing at a fairly deep level, with clean data. You know, I'm going to try it again, but we need better, a better data repository, better notion of state and history. So, um, yes, I mean, that, and we don't let our users become root. So anytime they are, it's a very bad thing. Um, but we have an administrative staff, on the other hand, who routinely does that. And so, you know, it's, there's a bit of a way to go. Platform for general baseline analysis that people could then tweak for their environment? I suppose, yeah. I mean, it's that would require um, a lot more than me. <laughs> but yes, I could, I could absolutely see that um, because a lot of that is driven by the um, kind of the nature of oddity, in that, you know, it really was designed and built for a one you know, per system mindset. And if you can then step away from that, which hopefully this does, um, you might be able to do better kind of cross-platform analyses from performance and, and tuning and whatnot. <laughs>